Data storytellers, today on the show, I have with me Brian Hogan. We had some good conversations before, both before he joined our community and during our interactions. And uh, now we're here to immortalize some of that inspiration and uh, explore his playbook. So, Brian, first of all, welcome on the show. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me, Laszlo. Good to see you again. Well, it's, it's a pleasure. So, uh, just as per usual, a quick introduction would be useful. So, can you uh, give maybe a short intro into what your mission is currently? Absolutely. So I work for uh, Southern Glaciers Wine and Spirits. We're we're the leader in the uh, industry, the wine and spirits um, industry. Uh, we lead in many different uh, ways. We're, we actually have uh, the largest share of market for wine and spirits in North America, but we're also an analytical leader. It's really part of our um, DNA, and we're very proud of that and how we're leading in analytics. I currently hold a position as a, a vice president, uh, and I'm in charge of shared um shared technology solutions. And that's everything from the very back end of data warehousing, all the BI analytical tools. I also have a little fun job with our suppliers and our customers and all of our data integrations that we do for them. So really have a great team at Southern Glaciers. Our company is really invested in um, analytics and we're really proud of that. And we're using them to grow share, uh, revenue share, um, share of market, um, percentage and category share, et cetera. So it's a very exciting time in our company. Mm. And indeed, I remember them when you and I spoke, even before um, you joined our sessions, I thought that you are in an exciting stage of the data transformation journey and you definitely bring a wealth of experience. So can you speak a little bit into that? Like what got you into analytics in the, in the first place in your career? Yeah, I mean, we're we're pretty mature. We're at least 10 good solid years into our journey to get where we want to go. But the thing about analytics is so much, so much more to learn, to do, to grow in um, our business. And and when you start introducing new things, even like AI, which is, is the buzz, it just opens up an entire new world of analytics. And I find that uh, extremely um, challenging, but it's also refreshing. Every time you get to a corner, you look around the corner and there's more to see more to do, more to understand. Um, you know, our, our economy, we're clearly in the digital age of um, economy, uh, and that takes analytics. All the data is there, which is um, fantastic. But how do, you, how do you harness that and start learning new, new things and exploring new things, new insights with customers, new insights with um, suppliers, how a customer might, might interact with your digital experience that you're giving them? So it's not only about, you know, hey, I need to sell more of this. It's also could be behavioral analytics. Uh, and maybe they like a, a product placement on the left-hand side of, you know, what they're looking at online. Who, who, who knows? But that's what, you know, data re really can uh, unlock. And that's what we're trying to get to. Got it. And when um, you and I spoke, so that's why you uh, are still on this journey. And uh, why did you join our masterclass in the first place, if, if you can rem uh, remember? Like, what was your intention going into that, ex into that experience? Yeah. Honestly, it was a good way to um, network uh, with, with folks I had, you know, profiled as, you know, in the same position or companies that, you know, I could speak to and, and really help based on, you know, our 10 years long uh, journey into the data space. I got to tell you, Laszlo, I really did my homework. I went on uh, your site plus LinkedIn and stalked a few people to understand their profile and why they joined as well. And it's really, it's really, um, it's really kind of funny. Um, you know, it's a very small community of analytics, um, and a lot of the stories across the folks that I interacted with have um, similar uh, change management issues. And they, they, they know they're on the right side of history with um, analytics and what they're trying to do with data. But, you know, there's blockers. And it was helpful for me to talk to other folks in similar positions and, and openly talk about in a safe space about those blockers and, and how to deal with them. I mean, just being on the right side of history doesn't always win uh, the war. There's other things you have to do to you know, get believers and evangelists and what we're trying to do with data and analytics. I love how you put it with uh, being on the right side of history. Yeah, I think a lot of people arrived at the conclusion of, okay, I see the dividing line. I see where I should stand, but it's a whole other question of, okay, how do we win the war? So I, I do like that analogy. What have you identified as the key blockers from your perspective across the board? You know, I, I would I would say, you know, this is including people I talk to, um, you know, during the data storytellers master um, class, it's really uh, about 
I would say you, even analog thinking versus digital type thinking. It's a total different mindset today than it was. And I start, I, I've only been in this business just to be fair. So this is my 33rd year in the wine and spirits business. So I came from the analog age of analytics. I, I had a notebook, I had a pencil, I had a calculator. And I was trying to improve my accounts through very simple, rudimentary um, analytics um, at that time. To, to same stuff, grow share, get new placements, grow revenue, all that stuff we were trying to do back then. But it was the simplest way to describe it. It was pencil and paper. And today we have these magnificent machines and we've got artificial intelligence and we've got all these type of tools. So it's been an incredible journey. And I, I can only say that there's going to be more, um, you know. Even after artificial intelligence, who knows what artificial intelligence can learn about artificial intelligence and take us to really the next level with analytics. And that's that's why I've really stayed on this journey. It's data and analytics are really uh, I'm very passionate about because I think they can be their own you know line of revenue. They can be their own line of business. And our company's really invested in that. That's what's really exciting about it. Okay. And I'm sure we will talk about also what really gets you excited now um over in your company about the opportunities but i think it, this is the time to kind of spend uh, a few minutes at least on what we found that the rest of the community really benefited from you in terms of your experience and what you brought to the table so i think we did identify this uh question of change management and i know for a fact that you're not a fan of the term necessarily and uh, i'm sure we'll, we'll dive into that um, but everyone, when they conceptualize their challenges, uh, a lot of the times, this is the big thing. It's like, my challenge is not the technology. It's not coming up with the right algorithms. It's not even really driving the business value because it's there. The blocker and the gap is change management. So um, maybe this is the time then to, to zoom in on your, on your playbook. So what is your approach? To this whole whole topic especially as you said you've been in this business for a while you haven't always been super sophisticated in analytics but now you're in a really good spot so how did you get here yeah we're we're really in a great spot um and i'll i'll take you back kind of the um the beginning because you know 10 years ago when we started this journey you know you said things that you knew were completely sane but people thought you were insane like there's no possible way if you start talking about uh, one single source of truth, one data how data warehouse for um, the company. But in the very beginning, um, if if you're in a role um, that is going to be the data analytics engine for your company, no matter how important or not important it is at that moment, um, the first thing I would say is is dream big. You know, ha have a have a vision and and literally write down your vision and start socializing um, that vision. You know, our, our vision was clearly to have one single source of truth. We wanted to have one common data lake. We wanted to have one common set of um, calculations with inside the um, data lake. We wanted to, I'm going to use it out, go fishing in the same data lake. Uh, and, you know, because data, if it proliferates outside a single source of truth, it can be manipulated. Uh, and that is not going to provide the company the same amount of value uh, than it would with your work strategy of having, you know, one data lake. So that's, that's really number one, but, but dream big and be bold. Uh, the world is not flat here. It's very, very round and you can, you can dream big and you can cite thousands and thousands of examples from companies that went big and, and really are paying, um, themselves back for the amount of, you know, work they've done in the analytical space to, to get them in, into a new, um, new frontier of business. So dream big. Yeah. And, uh, on this one, I would uh, try to stay away from using too many cliches, but that whole image of, you know, shooting for the stars, landing on the moon or something like that, it's a very, very practical advice, you know, even psychologically. So when you can conceptualize an ambitious aim, uh, then whatever progress you make towards that, even if you do not attain exactly that thing that you saw before, which is almost like impossible anyways, because, you know, you're not a sage, you don't see into the future, but you can definitely aim, right. aim there and you will end up in a better spot where now you have all kinds of opportunities that you couldn't even have conceptualized before. And I always say that even with storytelling, storytelling really is that idea of painting a vision of the future that we all now collectively strive 
to reach. It's like an alternative version of reality that we are not in just yet, but by having the right image, shooting and doing the right things will get us in a better spot. And as you said, also chronologically, like change is accelerating. So you have no idea what kind of doors will your actions open if you're just ambitious and you dream big. So I really like that, that approach. Um, well, it's, it's really interesting that you're, you know, the master class is called data storytellers. Cause I think that's one of the next frontiers of, um, analytics, right? Because we can put things on paper and show opportunities to, you know, sales leaders in our companies. But without the backbone of a story and walking them through the numbers, um, there's less value. I think that's the next level of analytics. Forget artificial intelligence for a second, but you know, weaving in a story with the numbers now, that's that's really starting to be cutting edge from what I see. Mm, absolutely. And is that your kind of next stage of look, dream big and focus on storytelling? So uh, is it like a, a absolutely next bullet point? Yeah, I tell you, that's um, that's a difficult um, you know, skill set to have. You know, people who are amazing in analytics and have the ability to make the the numbers come alive through through a story. Um, so I think there's going to be plenty of opportunity for folks who can who can do both uh, for sure. Be amazing in analytics plus weave in a dramatic story to to really win hearts and minds and. And really push the business forward. Mm -hmm. So maybe if we zoom in on this a little bit. So uh, where do you see the big pitfall of actually not stepping into that next frontier? So doing analytics in the old fashioned way where you're basically content with just being the architect, but you fail to kind of level up into being also a powerful ambassador of, of analytics. So, so what is the main pitfall and risk here? But I, I think at any company today, is, if they want to be at scale, uh, they risk the fear of being left behind. Um, digital uh, age, data age, analytical age is going to push companies for the next 25 years. And if you're not beginning, at least on that journey at this point, um, you know people are going to be smarter than you. Pe disruptors, and there's disruptors in every single category. And guess what they do first is they do their homework, which is the analytics. And that's one of the reasons they're so successful with disrupting, uh, you know, big businesses. We've, we've seen it every day. I mean, the Netflix example now is almost a cliche in what they did with Blockbuster, but they did it through analytics and understanding what people wanted and understanding where customers were going to meet them, you know, with their journey. So a lot of companies, whether they believe it or not, are in that pos same position and they're going to be left behind unless they, you know, invest heavily in, into data and to analytics uh, to keep up. Um, so hugely important. Mm -hmm. And then if we think about data analytics leaders themselves, so what kind of opportunities do you think that powerful storytelling, really mastering narratives, taking ownership of the narrative of data science and analytics within the business, but often we talk about how actually you can be the steward of the narrative of the entire company because you have a unique access to truth that no one else has. And you can really make that truth work for the company and the stakeholders in the company if you can master and you can wield that story the right way. So uh, maybe if we just like sell that idea uh, a little bit, what do you think is there to gain? What is the great opportunity here for data analytics leaders if they manage to step into this frontier? Yeah, it's, it's really putting your data to work. And you can see it across many industries and the wise spirits industry is not immune to this. What companies are doing, what large companies are doing in investing in new C-suite type positions, whether it's the chief data officer or the chief digital officer, the chief digital and, and information officer. And so there's all these new titles that have really popped up literally within the last uh, five or eight years that are really important uh, to very big companies um, in our business. And what they're really good about is evangelizing the data and making smart decisions, whether it be a, a brand uh, or how to market a brand. Uh, and they're using data to do that now. They, they weren't doing that um, 10 years ago. They were doing it, but it was more analog. And now, now we have so much more data and so much more processing power behind the data that they're, they're hiring amazing leaders with this data, data storytelling um, ability. Uh, and now you give them the, the, the pure, the accurate um, 
most relevant data, and they're able to create that story at a very high level and move companies in different uh, directions. And I see it all the time. Mm, 100%. So we're definitely on track. So dream big, use storytelling to achieve that vision, that ambitious uh, version of reality uh, that is yet in the future. Uh, what is the next step? Yeah, um, I would say measure measure twice, but uh, cut once. Um, set some set some goals, some KPIs for yourselves as you take this journey. They could be you know system performative uh, in the early stages of how the system performs and how it's you know calculating the data and making the data data available for users. You could you could look at uh, things like data accuracy to make sure that it is exactly what uh, you intended it to be. But um, measure it, measure it twice, and create those um, KPIs as you go up. And again, write them down, put them, put them in your, put them in your playbook so you can refer back to them. But that that'd be really step number two. Okay. And on that note, so getting the right KPIs, the the right value driven KPIs. Um, what are your best practices on identifying those KPIs? To begin with, do you have any particular like secret sauce of how you come up with those to make sure that you know wherever you cut is the right place to cut? Yeah, I, I think this this involves a little bit of your relationship um, skill set because you've really got to tap it. There's tons of SMEs, you know, subject matter experts at any of these companies, and you have to really get into kind of the DNA of the company. So as, you know, a data evangelist, analytic uh, evangelist, you're going to have to spend a lot of time with the people, people who know stuff, right? And start understanding uh, what the company is, where it, where it can go, and utilizing these folks to, to really understand what your KPIs need to be um, along the way. We had many, many conversations with people who had multiple decades um, in this business, and we tried to draw out of them what's, what's really important, what, what moves the needle, what builds a brand. What do you look at when you build a brand? How do you know when it's saturated through the market? How do you know when marketing works? And so we started to start understanding kind of their uh, sales and marketing calculus about how they've been thinking about it for years and years and years and years. And we turn those into more or less digital KPIs that we were able to measure. Um, you know, one of them was speed, speed to market. They wanna make decisions quickly. So we put a KPI around you know, extracting the data we need and getting it to the data lake uh, in time for, for them to do their analysis and, uh, you know, drive business. So I would, you got to have a relationship uh, ability uh, in this. It sounds a little bit um, oxymoron because you're dealing with numbers all day, but you got to be able to tap into the, you know, the talent that's at your company already. Hmm. And, you know, that's the, the it's both an art and a science. It, actually managing that and balancing that, how to work with the numbers and how to make those numbers human, you know, whether we talk about data analytics and presenting numbers and tendencies, or whether it's about the KPIs, it is about that human glue, that's human connection. Okay, so that's when- It's funny, art and science balance, that's right. And now you see, you know, so over the last three years, the people, people hiring data scientists. Well, I can tell you those data scientists have to have a little bit of art to them too, to be able to understand uh, when, you know, big sales leaders talk about how they want to push business forward. Well, it's got to be translated back to, uh, ones and zeros in the back end. Um, so, you, but you have to be able to have that conversation up front with them. So very important as well. Maybe you'll talk about this, but I'll just shoot the question and, uh, uh, see if it's something that you might cover later on. But, um, what is your approach to making sure that you have that nice balance of the scientists and the artists? or you know those capabilities fused in a single person do you hire for it do you train for it is it a mix yeah i would i would love to say it's really really easy just hire a bunch of data scientists and you know everything become becomes a widget and it's all really really easy well in practicality it's really really not you still need a lot of folks from your own organization uh, i would say we're probably uh, a hybrid you know we want to build and buy talent, but I can tell you, I am so excited about what the universities are doing and there's such a wealth of talent that we're able to um, recruit and build. Um, these students coming out of college, they have amazing uh, analytical uh, capability, advanced analytical um, capabilities. They're 
they're teaching the tools that we use. They're teaching them at college. So they're, they're analytical ready, right? They might have no idea, you know, how to spell uh, wine, but they understand how to do the analytics. And what I can, what I tell them is we, we can help you teach the, you know, the rest. We, we can help you with the relationships. We can put you in front of leaders that can help you round you out. So you can translate that back to really, really good analytics. So I would say it's, it's, it's a mix of both. It's a bit of a hybrid in terms of uh, the other side of the coin is we had to have people now. We had to have di- data scientists now because we have extreme pressing needs, you know, around our digital uh, experience or digital commercial experience, and we needed professionals who could step in, and we we certainly did that um, as well. But we've got a dual strategy. Mm, got it. And then, are there any best practices for, let's say, the training side of this? I know that. Because we talk a lot about data literacy, yeah, how the business should become more data literate. And uh, I think now, especially these days, I think the conversation is becoming more meaningful now with uh, a lot more meaningful questions being asked about, wait a second, look, what are we actually doing with data lit- literacy? Do we actually want to make sure that every single person in the company understands the nuances of a data mesh? Or are we shooting for something else? Like, what are we actually addressing here? And this conversation naturally always leads to, wait a second data literacy is one side, but what about business literacy in the data uh, uh, team, in the data capability? So in that sense, that training, do you guys have any best practices? I know it's a difficult subject and no one really has a silver bullet. This, this, this one's really difficult, right? Because if you're part of a sales organization, sales organizations want action now. Uh, and, and, and what you have to do is, uh, and it's going to sound silly, but you got to let them explore. You know, give them, give them their their palette full of colors, which is to me is, you know, accurate data, large amounts of data, but you're going to have to let them off the leash a little bit. And they're going to have to be given the freedom to explore because the folks that we found that it do really, really well are one of the DNA of an analyst to me is curiosity. And if you try to stifle their curiosity with um, timelines uh, and, and things that constrain their ability to be creative, um, that is not a good place for an analyst to be. What you need to do is set them up with the right data, the, the color pal- palette, as I call it, and you got to let them go. And you got to leave them alone for a little while so they can really start digging into the data and start drawing out you know, conclusions and finding patterns and finding trends that they can bring back to you. And once they find those things and they trust you, they will come back to you very happy to, to present to you, you know, remarkable analysis and opportunities um, into into data and into your business. Okay, now this is super useful, even though it was kind of a tangent, I know that we deviated a little bit from the you know, dream big and dream bold, next frontier of analytics is storytelling and measure twice, cut once. Um, what is the fourth one? Yeah, this one's, this one's kind of fun for me um, because I, I'm a data evangelist and I love to talk about it, but if you've ever heard of an elevator pitch, it's it's that moment in time that you have just by happenstance ran into the CEO of your company, and what are you gonna what are you gonna tell that person? And they're gonna ask you, "Hey, what are you working on?" Well, you've got about fifteen seconds to divulge, you know, your entire world that you've been working on, and the teams you're building, and the tools you're using, and the data you have available for the company, well, guess what? You got to condense that down to 15 seconds because that's about as much time as you're going to get for them. So start thinking about your elevator speech, make it very concise um, and and make it really, really relevant. 50,000 feet, we're trying to do X and we have all these pieces in in place and we're going to produce Y. It's got to be that um, concise and they'll really uh, really appreciate it. They might ask you, hey, what do you need to be successful? If And you better have that answer ready for you as well. So it's really the elevator pitch, getting that ready and physically just write it down. Like it doesn't have to be perfect grammar, but you have to have something uh, because those little sound bites travel a long way in, in companies to make, um, you know, in our case, data analytics even more important, even more relative. Because if you can recite that and you start getting your C-suite to start talking about data analytics at their board meetings and their lunches and whenever they get together, it's it's going to be a huge, huge win. So have that elevator p- pitch ready and, uh, you know, repeat often. Yeah, because the good news, even if people heard it already, it needs to be shared again, again, and again. And basically the 15 second idea, 
So 100%, uh, I agree. I would even put like an additional uh, um, kind of like a disclaimer there that fi that, that 15 seconds in 2023, well, that's actually like one and a half to three seconds and then another one and a half and three seconds that you need to need to win every single time because someone you yeah. might have 15 seconds in the elevator but if the first three seconds don't resonate with the person then they will be thinking about what they will do after they get out of the elevator uh, elevator right and it will shut down on yeah you. exactly yep. and the whole idea of oh just stay with me for a second because my punchline's coming does not work anymore it's just people don't have that kind of attention span you know you can put it on whatever you know mm -hmm. screens and social media it doesn't matter what caused it, it's a reality. So I think it's more important than ever to have that really polished, well calibrated pitch to go, which is just a story. I know that even, you know, people I'd say, you know, I don't like to sell things. I don't want to pitch people. Well, guess what? A lot of times it's kind of like if you don't have the capacity, it's not a virtue of not doing that thing. Usually it just says that I can't sell. That's why that's why I'm not pitching. And selling uh that bad rep, I think, comes from being people being comfortable, kind of creating a distance between themselves and sales and I don't have anything to sell what well, everyone has something to sell but some people absolutely some people can sell it and some people can and selling if you want to use storytelling that's a better phrase and you know that makes you more comfortable than use that that's the same thing good sales is a good storytelling and then if you have the right narrative where you actually connect to how people psychologically process messages and there are so many frameworks that add the whole emotional buying first and then the logical the logical justification, creating first curiosity and the, then intrigue and really uh, firing up the, the emotions for that person to want whatever you're selling on the other side and then uh, really locking that in with the necessary confidence for them to say, I want to do it and only then talk about what it is that you're going to do, right? All that needs to be in place and it cannot be ad hoc. You can you just can't do it on the fly. You need to think about it choicefully. You need to think about it strategically and you need to polish it off because it's kind of like Benjamin Franklin running with the kite in the storm. You never know when the lightning will hit and you got to be there with the kite. That's right. That's right. And that, you know, speaking to other colleagues and during the uh, masterclass, they, they need a little little more confidence in that area too and, and really understand the value of this elevator pitch. And it, 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 it could be some insight that you, you learn. Hey, Mr. CEO, I've figured out, I believe these are all the ingredients of the next trend in whatever it is. Like we should be, uh, you know, focused on this and we, I think there's a huge upside or whatever the message is, make sure you have that ready. And that's, that's kind of out of, out of comfort zone, um, for, for a lot of folks who've been in traditional data analytics, but again, weaving that story on top of that is going to help them. And then to your point, they're not selling something, right? It's, it's, it's a pitch. It's an idea. It's about how to move your, your company forward. So, you know, the, the, you know, some folks are just going to have to get um, uncomfortable uh, and that's going to be part of the, the a data analytic person's DNA um, for, for the next 25 years, right? Until something new comes along. So get comfortable with being uncomfortable and, and have your elevator pitch ready. 100%. And actually, even here at uh, TDS, apart from like rolling out these uh, playbooks, these are exactly the kinds of exercises that we will kind of push our community members to go through because in general, we always talk about how the creating this data story engine strategically is so important so that you uh, kind of get a grip and control of the narrative in the organization. But I think you're 100% correct. It starts with that 15 seconds. And from that 15 seconds, yeah. it's kind of like that seed that that, then later on you can grow into a tree, which will yield fruits if it's uh, you know cultivated the right way. I don't know where this analogy breaks down, but it I, I think it works so far. Um, fantastic. All right. So dream big, storytelling, KPIs, and now we had get your elevator pitch in place. So great step so far for effective change management. Uh, what else is there, Brian? Yeah, I'd say the next one is um, uh, simplify. Um, simplify your toolbox. You're not don't don't set out to build a Swiss Army knife. Um, that take took many centuries for the Swiss to figure out that they needed you know 24 tools in in one knife. Like don't don't go for that. Go for go for simple. Go for simple tools. Go for a simple uh, data backend. Don't build something too complicated that you'll never never accomplish start start smaller uh and accomplish little things and little things over time become big things you know 
this and, and this will help your elevator pitch as well. The simpler it is, the it is, you know, your, either your tools or your data warehouse, the easier it is to explain to, to anyone. Don't build this complicated thing. It's not it's not necessary in the beginning. Will there be more technology, more complicated things that you can bolt on, tack on, you know, add on later? Absolutely. But if you start off with this hugely complex core and a way to, you know, store your data or the tools you put on top of it, that is the wrong way to start. Start simple. Um, simplify uh, and, and, and everything will be a lot easier in the beginning. So this is so funny because it keeps coming up on uh, the simplification idea. In fact, one of your uh, fellow masterclass attendees, uh, Elon, Elon Kazi from Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, so we're mm -hmm. going to have a similar session with him and his playbook is on simplification as this core concept, Excellent. both in messaging, both in organizational management, uh, uh, the operating models, the technology stack that you have in everything, simplification. And it, it's all, it, it was strange to me, like, why is this such a huge issue? I have some thoughts around it, but why do you think it's so tempting to always like convolute and complicate everything, especially in the, in the field of data science and analytics. Yeah, it could be, you know, a legacy from, you know, folks who've done technology for years and years and years. But the the most relevant example I can give you, I mean, it's really Steve Jobs, right? The Apple iPhone, when it came out, it was incredibly complex. And it did things that a phone or a camera or a music player never did before. And it was easy. But it was the most complex thing ever, and he was able to explain it very um, simply. And I think if we, as you know, a masterclass alumni now, if we you know really evangelize that and socialize that, uh, and and show where it can live in two places, it can be complex and simple at the same time. I think that really helps um, your story. It's so funny that you mentioned uh, Steve Jobs and Apple because I'm just working on an article. So that means a lot of our content like, spins out into that story of Apple. And I think it's not a coincidence because it's a perfect example. Apple is the, the highest value brand in the world right now by a large margin too. I mean, their profit margins are just like beyond what anything in the, in the next top 10 companies would even dream of, right? And also just pure volume, they have, I don't know, like, I don't even know, like it's a trillion dollar company, even more now, maybe it's like two, I, it's I don't even know, it's silly. But, but how they achieved that um, was that idea of simplification and then those simple messages connected to the human beings. So if you think about the iPhone, I mean, the iPhone, it's, it's almost like its own category. It's an iconic thing, the iPhone. But we always forget that the iPhone in and of itself, we had a Microsoft iPhone before. We had a Sony iPhone before the iPhone. Mm -hmm. No one remembers because how they approached it, first of all, they approach it from like selling the technology. It's like how impressive it is that, you know, this powerful processor and then this kind of touchscreen technology, they, they always like miss the mark on how to market that and message that it was complicated. They relied on the faith of, Hey, users will just love this so much that they, you know, we can educate the users about it. But then what Steve jobs did, and this is like a, this was an iconic scene of that first iPhone promo on stage, but he says that a phone, a music player and a, a, a uh, an advanced web, uh, access device a phone, mm -hmm. a music player, a, an advanced web access device. And then he repeats it three times and he says, are you getting it? And that was just like, so brilliant. It's like, he didn't go into these like convoluted complex ideas. No, no, no. Are you getting it? Are you getting this like very simple, but like historically, uh, uh, nuclear idea that I'm presenting to you. And why it will yeah. be so powerful is not because no one ever did something like this is because of how we're doing it and how we're telling you the story. It's just brilliant. Yeah. And look, and, and maybe I'm dating myself here, but there used to be a thing called owner's manual. And I think where those old, um, Samsung and Sony, I think you th said smartphones messed up. It, it came with a manual. Like you had to read a manual to operate their device. No one's doing that. And then you put an Apple uh, iPhone in in their hands and anybody can use it. That's the simplification I'm talking about. It just, and obviously we know the results of being um, simple, but it's not 
far away from what we're trying to accomplish with um, data analytics as well. I mean, keep it, keep it simple. Like people get simple. People want it to be simple, by the way, too. They don't want to read an owner's manual to figure out how to use it. You know, um, absolutely. You remember uh, that data story from the masterclass from Dave Coughlin, where he uh, talks about activating analytics opportunities and how the app is the apex predator of data science. So he kind of brought that example of how they created what uh, actually became popular uh, uh, at CVS as the uh, as Disneyland for salespeople that app that they created, yeah. right? And it's so true yeah. because I remember like buying like the first iPhone that I had and I was never a techist. I'm still not, by the way. I'm not like dazzled by technology, but I just I just uh, found myself like holding my iPhone in my hands, you know? It's just like, it just felt so intuitive, felt so, felt so good in general and you just want to interact with it. It's just so intuitive, it kind of pulls you in. It's the opposite of me having to like flip through a 200 page owner's manual even to start using the device. It's almost like right. only it's all about the, the simple intuitive design. And oh, I always mention this as a caveat though, that it's not like Apple uh, also neglects creating a powerful hardware that's so well put together because it is like, it's just so smooth. And if you actually open up the hood, I mean, uh, but Steve Jobs was notorious for demanding how the hardware should look like, even though no one will ever see it. You can't even open it. Right, but it needs to be so neat inside. But again, that's just a side note because it always started from the customer, from the user, with simple intuitive design. So that's fantastic. Okay, that's that that, that that's our fifth step. Yeah, right this there. could be this could be another KPI you want to measure. Like, how do you measure simple? Right. Well, perhaps it could be you know adoption level. Like, you know, what percentage of your user population is actually using this data lake that you've created for them, and how often, how frequently are they on it? You know how fast they got on it, et cetera. That could be another KPI to consider um, as you go around your journey because you do want to be supple. Hundred mm, percent. So, but we already have five steps: dream big, tell stories, measure twice, cut once, chisel up your elevator pitch, and simplify everything that you can. Um, is there anything else in the uh, in the toolbox? Oh, yeah, there's plenty. I mean, Fantastic. the next one's really around teamwork. It's it's not about you. <laughs> You're going to need a lot of team members, a lot of smart folks with data analytics uh, backgrounds, and it's not it's not on you uh, to do all this stuff. Um, teamwork makes the data work, as 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 I like to say, and it's it's really a team sport. There, I guarantee you, at every company, you know, at least that I've come across with, you know, from the master class and the other colleagues I I talk to, they have pockets of data greatness throughout their company that are literally just waiting to be um, tapped into um, for their knowledge. Go go recruit those people. Mm. There's people like myself, a lot younger than myself, who you know <laughs> want to be in data and analytics as a professional, uh, and that's their passion. Uh, go unlock that. Go meet people who are salespeople. Go meet people who are finance people. Go meet people who are HR people or supply chain people and start tapping into that vast talent in your, your company. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing what you'll go find. Um, so, so put a, put a, um, hiring sign right outside your office or your cubicle and say, Hey, I'm looking for really passionate people about data analytics and watch them come out of the woodwork, but it's a team sport. It's going to take a lot of, um, um, socializing. It's going to take a lot of leadership. Um, it's going to take a lot of those elevator pitch, um, you know, uh, words, but you got to recruit a, a team, but. There's greatness within your company. I, I guarantee it. Go go recruit that. Mm. What are the indicators of, of data greatness? Like, what are you actually looking for? What's a what's a good uh, uh, signal that 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 might be an opportunity to tap into? Yeah, I I'll go back to um, really the the finding that element of um, curiosity in someone who can who can look at something, a situation, a could be a sales situation. It could be a supply chain situation, and they're thinking about it a little bit differently. And one of their responses, or one of their top five responses, will be, "Can I have some more data around that situation so I can do a proper analysis and round out all the things I know about that and bring back to you, you know, what I believe is the, the truth and the path forward." That that's the that's the capabilities. That's a skill set that I'm looking for when I go re recruit people who, you know, want to be around data and analytics, that, 
you can't walk and hold hands, you know, through the journey. They've got to bring a level of curiosity that's going to continue to keep them motivated and interested. And and they're like I said before, they're they're out there in your company because most of the people that I have on on my team and around our company are extremely passionate about it, but they're always curious. That's kind of the cornerstone of their DNA. Okay, makes perfect sense. And by the way, I know that we will soon run out of time uh, because that's what happens when the conversation is good. We can always, like, I guess, do a follow up if we run out of time. Uh, I don't want to rush. I don't want to like bash through these uh, valuable bullet points. But what would be what would be the seventh step after after teamwork and finding the pockets of data greatness? Um, I would say this one this one kind of ties to it a little bit, but seek out those data evangelists and. And I, and I always stop short of calling it, you know, change management because changing people is really, really hard, but winning hearts and minds could be a little bit easier um, for folks. So you have to have those people, once you get them on staff, really be your evangelist. So now you're multiplying the number of elevator, co elevator pitches that you're having across the, the, the company exponentially. So now you're spreading the word about data and analytics and what can be discovered, what can be unlocked. There's value out there. We're going after that value um, for the company and on the company's uh, behalf. But seek out those data uh, evangel evangelicals. And then with those data evangelists, like what kind of preparation and training, if anything, you need to do to make sure that, you know, when they go out there, they can actually, you know, convert those, those hearts and minds. Oh, well, it's basically our conversation today on this podcast <laughs> about a thousand times over because I'll have this conversation. That's why it's so easy for me to talk about because that's that's what I do every day with with folks and to, to keep them on track, to keep them highly motivated, to, to keep them uh, moving forward. But if you find the right DNA, man, they r really want to be in this and they want to be a professional in data analytics. It, it all comes together. But <laughs> this would be on rinse and repeat about a thousand times. Okay, maybe it will be. Maybe that's how we will position it. You know, it's like <laughs> just, just put it on uh, uh, repeat and uh, you know use that to make your uh, evangelical efforts in the company even more impactful. All right, so now we're past seven, which is working with those data evangelists and data champions, uh, make, making sure that they can spread the good news. Uh, what's the eighth step? Yeah, I would say. Um go back and revisit your vision that you wrote down often um stay on course stay on course with that vision um f follow that north star whatever your company ends up calling it uh because it, it's going to be bumpy uh there's there maybe results aren't coming quick enough and there'll be people questioning you know what what we're trying to accomplish in, in data analytics but that's par for the course um expect it um and again, you're on the right side of history. So continue down. Don't stop. <laughs> Don't stop your journey. Um, even if you, like you say, you know, shoot for the stars and get to the moon. Well, that's really, really good. Uh, and that's going to move your, your company forward. So there will be bumps along the way. There, there'll be um, people who uh, don't believe they may want to do things like they've been doing it for years. Um, and you're revealing it a new way. Stay on the path. Hmm. Stay on the path. Yeah, that... Emotional roller coaster, that's just part of the game. In fact, that's why we have people who are extremely successful in this and people who are who, who less so. You know, that kind of resilience is that just uh, saying the course. And that's true, I think, not just for data analytics, but even if you look at, you know, small companies, startups. Um, you know, I've been involved with many ventures, and that's really one of the main differentiators between those who will actually make it and people who might be extremely talented, but just don't have that kind of kind of grit and resilience to stay the course when the going gets tough. Absolutely. All right, we're approaching the 10th, but we have a ninth uh, uh, yard to cover, I guess, before. So what would what, what would that be? Um, I would say, I call this one guarding um, the castle. Like, whether you believe it or not, all your data has value. Your data could have more value than the products that your sales team sells. So guarding the castle is about data security, data privacy. Always realize that your, ha your, your data has value to someone on the very extreme. It could be um, a cyber criminal who wants to lock up your data. Um, so guard the castle. 
and always know that your data has value. It could become a revenue stream someday. Um, you could syndicate it to customers and suppliers or, or, or any other companies who want that data. It's extremely valuable in today's age, so guard the castle. Uh, make sure your, your data privacy and security walls are up. Make sure you're best friends with your uh, chief security officer um, so that everything is um, secure and it's there when you need it. Mm. Also, it's a very useful storytelling tool, especially in that part of the narrative. So it's not the curiosity um, part, it's not the intrigue. It's not even the like hard cognitive people buying into the excitement or attaining some sort of desire or eliminating some pain. It's really the confidence part. So in fact, if in your elevator pitch, whoever you're talking to, you can find some space uh, as kind of a reassurance, or maybe not even the elevator pitch itself, but when you're when you're doing like a longer uh, presentation, a lot of times these are unspoken, sometimes subconscious uh, concerns or objections, and it's a really useful tool to create additional confidence to your pitch by actually shining a light on your impressive data security efforts. We've seen that all the time. Absolutely. It, you know, in, in the C-suite C boardrooms today, you know, if they're not talking about cyber safety, uh, you know, in five minutes, then there's probably something wrong. Um, there's criminal enterprises out there worth billions of dollars <laughs> who are professional, organized, uh, bad actors who would love nothing more than to lock up your company's uh, data. So super important in the boardroom. And again, like you say, Maybe it's maybe it's part of that elevator speech that you know the C suite asks you, hey, well, what else do you need? Well, it's got to be secure, hey. um, and maybe work in there, guard the castle. Yeah, absolutely, it's a positive emotion that you can transfer through that, you know, because you know, even the cyber criminal is just like any bully; they will seek out weakness, and you can just reassure your key stakeholders that while well, they will need to find someone else to bully, because we, we will be a brick wall. And it's a great way to uh, create additional security around your message. Fantastic. Okay, we are at the 10th uh, bullet point. Uh, what would that be? Yeah, so I would say uh, flexibility wins. Don't be, as a leader in analytics, don't be stuck in the way you think about data or your calculus of how a problem should be um, solved. It can be solved in many ways. And this is really where the art of data analytics um, comes alive and to use an analogy, go go look at Pablo Picasso's last self painting. You might not even think that's a uh, human. It's so incredibly creative. If someone had tried to cor you know correct correct uh, Pablo Picasso, he, he might have just quit. But it turned out to be one of the most valuable paintings in the world. So there's there's a real balance, I would say, of of liking art enough to allow your folks to be uh, creative and flexible and come up with their own. Um, solutions or, or ways they come up with their conclusions. So, uh, be be a very flexible manager. This is this is art. This is not, you know, arithmetic. It really feeds into resilience and the whole whole anti fragility idea. Um, that agility, instead of uh, you know you being you know too flimsy or weak in your com uh, convictions, um, it's actually not true. Like you can actually be very firm in your willingness to uh, experiment. In fact, another uh, a person from the masterclass, Kate from Miro, uh, was the head of marketing analytics. She found that where she really had uh, a great insight to share with, with, with others was how to create that culture of experimentation. It's almost like how to become flexible, to become resilient and powerful in the business as an analytics function. So uh, guess what? We're going to have a playbook on that too. Well, you know, we do a little exercise. It's a lot of fun with our, our data people. And um, we'll call it a hackathon or call it a data hackathon or whatever you want to call it. But, like, dedicate time for creativity. Um, get them out of the grind. Put them in small groups. Give them a real uh, business problem to solve. Obviously, give them the data sets and the tables that they need to go get the data. Let them work um let them work on it as a project. You know, set a defined amount of time that they want to do a day, day and a half, something like that, and make them present present back to you know leadership. Because not only do they get really, really uh, crazy creative, they come up with a solution, and now you're asking them to put that data story on top of it and play that back. That's going to help their skill sets build um, tremendously. Again, I think that's the part that 
we we need to continue to focus on the ability to come up with the conclusion but have that story on top of it to make it real for other people mm. um so i i would highly encourage activities like hackathons 100 percent. so guarding the castle and then 10th flexibility can you please elaborate a little bit on that so um here's what i would recommend um you you, you do need to set a framework um you need to have a vision a picture of what this um uh, is going to look like, uh, and you have to set guardrails for, for folks, but you don't want to set such strict <laughs> rules with inside your framework that you stifle, you know, creativity. Um, and I call that kind of, you know, freedom in the framework. So you're building this framework, but you allow freedom within it to be uh, flexible and to get the most out of your folks that are along your journey. Remember, you're taking a bunch of people on this journey with you. It's, you're not going by yourself and you're going to need people to reach your destination. Um, so it's important to allow freedom and creativity with inside that framework and guardrails that you set up. All right. So your approach is you no know, stay flexible any day of the week in the long run or not even, you don't need to wait a lot, but still things will fall into place and it will pay Absolutely. dividends as opposed to trying to like push your agenda with a single minded focus. All right. Absolutely. So the framework there is key. Um, what is 11? Uh, so I think we still have a, a, a few steps to go here. Yeah, everyone's probably heard this one. Um, um, I, I think change management, kind of that uh, term is really cliche now. I'd like to think of it as change encouragement. I mean, everyone's heard the stories. If you don't change, you're, you're going to be out of business. You'll be the next blockbuster and all that. I'd like to spin that a little bit differently and get people excited about uh, change in a little bit of different ways. Uh, you know, saying change management people scares people. So change it to change encouragement. Hey, we want you to come along on this journey. There's great benefit for the company. There's great benefit for you. Uh, we encourage you to change with us uh, because we're going in a different direction. We're going to be unlocking uh, value, unlocking insights um, for our companies. And this is really what's going to be able to fuel our business uh, for the foreseeable future. Hmm. Yeah, I, I do think that you know, change management is one of those terms that we heard so many times that people get desensitized to it. Yes. Also, uh, that's a really good point that uh, unless you actually push and encourage people, no one wants to change. Like that's just like, like without that kind of encouragement, um, uh, the, needle, the needle won't move. Now, at the same time, <clears throat> with the term, um, do you think it's a little bit maybe more holistic, the management part, because it's not just about actually advocating for that change and pushing that mm -hmm. change, which again is crucial and necessary. Uh, but at the same time, kind of allowing the conditions for that change to happen in a, in a smooth way. So it still, it still counts though. It's still a better way to look at it as change encouragement instead of the management approach thing. Yeah, I think so. I think you need to have obviously structure around, uh, this is a large change for a lot of companies. Um, we're pretty mature into the, into the change and a lot of people are accustomed at my company, but I can see, you know, folks, in the beginning of their journey, making sure that they have the right structure, they they have the right leadership voices to talk about where the the company is, go is going, you know, along with yourself. Um, and so you do you do need a change management program, but once you're inside the journey, I'd like to flip that on its head a little bit and call it change encouragement to bring people along with you. Mm -hmm. If you remember in the masterclass, we had a bonus uh, case study from Pete Williams from Penguin Random House. It was yep. the, creating a data literate ecosystem. And uh, he had this phrase I re really liked, which is build it and they do not come. So it's, <laughs> it's just so true because a lot of times people fall into that of, oh, I'm going to build these amazing things is the best thing since sliced bread. And well, no one actually uses it. So without that mm -hmm. kind of pushing encouragement. Okay, that's great. That's great. It's a, it's a good directional uh, commitment that you have towards change and making sure that it actually follows through. Um, the twelfth step. I know we have more than twelve steps, but the twelfth, uh, the, the, yeah, the twelfth must be iconic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this one's um, and it ties back to kind of that central theme of having that flexibility. But don't let perfect um get in the way of good. It happens all the time. Good is really good, and it's acceptable, and it provides insights and and allows you to unlock value uh in in data. Uh, but if you're going for perfect every time, it, it's going to get in your way. You, you'll never achieve perfection. Look, Lexus has had a, you know, slogan for years about striving for perfection, or I forget what it's called exactly, but they're, they're never going to achieve it. Mm -hmm. But what they do have is a really good product in the Lexus uh, vehicle. So mm -hmm. don't let the, don't let perfection get in the way of what you're trying to accomplish because what you're trying to accomplish is going to be good and it's going to drive uh, insights and value for your company. Hmm. 
and so I'm so guilty of this. Uh, and I think over the years in my professional career, this is one of those things that I just needed to work really hard to get rid of, uh, perfectionism, because it is an illusion, this whole commitment to high quality, which is fantastic, by the way. Um, it needs to be a pursuit of perfection. You know, yeah. not like falling into the trap of thinking that I'm ever going to achieve it. I'm a huge Kobe Bryant fan, by the way, and he always said that I'm just chasing perfection. Very important that never attaining it, never achieving it, just constantly changing it, uh, changing it. You see, it? it's a Freudian slip, constantly chasing it. Um, chasing. Yeah, so uh, 100%. Now, um, with this also, we will have a data story with Kate from Miro. So she attended the masterclass with you and they have a really cool approach to building a culture of experimentation over at Miro. And when you fall into that, when even good, so, so good is good, but guess what? Bad is also good. Meaning yeah. that once you identified something that doesn't work, now you eliminated one option that you know that it's, it, we're not going to pursue this. It gives you clarity. It gives you more direction. It's invaluable, that information. And if you can make people comfortable with failing again not another another cliche of failing fast and be comfortable with failure but no one a lot of people preach it but few can actually practice it because it's very very uncomfortable it's incredibly uncomfortable but incremental changes i always say that the tour de france it's actually as probably right now the tour de france right mm -hmm. as we're yep. recording it I'm, I'm not sure i don't follow but i know that it is won by percentages you know 0.1 percent won on the tire pressure 1.5 percent won on the height of the seat and guess what? Very quickly, it adds up to 15, 20%, you know, which is a dominating win in the Tour de France. That's how the championship is won, you know, with those uh, percentages. So, yeah, absolutely. And those are little good wins along the way. I mean, you know, you think back to the great inventors uh, uh, in the United States and in the world, you know, Thomas Edison with the light bulb. Hey, you invented the light bulb. Well, well no, I got it wrong a thousand times. I only got it right once. So he eliminated a thousand ways it wasn't going to work and was able to produce that. So... That's that's really what we're going for here is 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 good because you're you're good is good and like you say sometimes you're bad is good too because you really can eliminate things so it won't work for you or for your company. Hundred percent. All right, a very important the twelfth step, I guess, letting go. You know, <laughs> so what yeah. is what is the thirteenth? <laughs> yeah, this is a bonus step, really, because um, and we're very mature into our um, you know journey here, but the journey never ends. Uh, keep keep exploring. There'll be new data sets. There'll be new ideas. There'll be new new technologies. I mean, you know, you look at uh, AI, it's going to really turn analytics uh, on its head, right? And there'll always be new things coming out. Um, and just consider it a journey. You're never going to, you know, get get to where you think. There's always more to explore. When you get to the moon, you want to go to Mars. When you get to Mars, you want to go even further into space. So um, keep exploring and keep your folks uh, motivated, give them the right um, tools and encourage them to really continue to go farther with data and analytics because this is really going to unlock a lot of value for your company. It kind of ties into the flexibility part too, right? So, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, don't shoot for that like holy grail state. It's more like in equip your team with the right skills and mindsets in general because this thing will never end. You will never, never arrive. You know the and now I mean I think uh, what what is that saying that the the destination is a journey or something so right yeah yeah I guess it applies I guess it applies whatever the saying is um, uh, yeah that's uh, very important we hear this all the time too that this whole continuous improvement another kind of buzzword but when applied just opens up so many doors for you and especially when you want to position yourself as this trusted advisor. Um, this is just so important to have that kind of mindset and attitude that people can kind of feel through however you interact with them on a, on a, on a native basis. All right. hundred yeah. percent. So, um, okay. We still have, I think st steps to go. So what would be the 14th? Actually, that's it. That's <laughs> it. That was it. Th 13th. Okay. Perfect. 13th Thir was the bonus one. We have 12 steps and a bonus. How about okay, that? Okay. 12 plus one. So look, this is fantastic. I think, you know, we went for like, I don't even know, like well over an hour uh, with these steps. So this is super useful, kind of a strategic roadmap slash uh, playbook slash checklist of change management. When you go to a new company and you want to go from zero to hero in terms of analytics. So this is super useful. Um, quick question. So just to finish um, the, the playbook off, uh, what would be your advice if you just needed to summarize, uh, like what is your recommendation 
to aspiring leaders in data analytics. So people who might do amazing work right now, they are building some stuff, but they have high career aspirations. And what would you advise them to do if they want to get the most out of this decade of data that's that's upon us? Yeah, I tell you, that's, that's really good to think about. Uh, I think about it a lot, but I will tell you that the folks that I've met uh, in and around data, in and around data and analytics, they're, they're quite passionate about the space uh, and they really like to talk about it. So I would find a network if you don't have a network, <laughs> leverage your existing network because people really want to help you. Like I am available for help, you know, depending on, you know, schedules and whatnot. I love talking about this and helping folks that are, um, you know, during, during the master class, it was really great to talk to folks who were year one into their journey and they're just thinking about data and how to leverage it as a company. I love talking about that. I would encourage anyone who's who's getting into it or into it for a while, find that network of folks. Um, Masterclass is fantastic. Data Storytellers is fantastic. LinkedIn has, you know, uh, places to go, people to find, but find a network that you can communicate with um, and, and, and leverage it because they really want to help. I, I want to help and I know a lot of my other colleagues that I've met through Masterclass, um, you know, they want to help as well. So don't, don't be shy, find that network. Absolutely. And look, I really appreciate that kind of attitude. I remember when you and I spoke, even before you joined the masterclass, I think you reached out to some people just from our website, like for example, Jody. Uh, Absolutely. And, yeah, yeah, and she's great. And you guys already hit it off. So even before you joined the masterclass, you you initiated the conversation. So uh, that's exactly the kind of uh, 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 kind of person that we're looking for in the masterclass because, you know, apart from you taking that value, we love that you bring your unique perspective and they actually make it work. And and uh, how the community to cross fertilize I mean, the knowledge. It, it's it's so therapeutic, you know. It might validate things you're thinking about, or eliminate things that you might not need to think about, right? And and that's that's why you have a, a network like that. So high, highly recommend. Awesome. Well, Brian, appreciate your insights. Appreciate your, uh, your uh, playbook. I know our audience will uh, love it, and we look forward to further collaborations with you in the not too distant future for sure. Fantastic. Good talking with you. Likewise.